Mark Lewison is an underappreciated Beatles historian. Prove me wrong. Dear sir or madam, have you read this book? It took Mark years to write. Will you take a look? In this video, we'll explore the publication the Sunday Post called Definitely a Book No Beatles Fan Will Want to Be Without. First published in 1988, this is the complete Beatles recording sessions, the official story of the Abbey Road years, 1962 to 1970. While originally released as a paperback in 2004, this edition being shown was released by UK publishing company Hamlin in 2021. My copy was included as one of a number of generous Beatles-related Christmas gifts I received from loved ones over the 2021 holiday. I'm going to go for this one first. That's a single one on. Huh? It's a book. Oh, nice. Oh, that's cool. I didn't, I didn't realize it was this, this uh, size when I... I had this on my list. That's, that's a nice book. I like this author too. He's good. Mark oh, Lewis. What is it? It's a book. Oh. Happy Christmas! Early in February 2022, I ran a poll asking viewers to choose one of five items they would like to see me dedicate my next video to. Let It Be Naked was the clear winner. But the complete Beatles recording sessions was the runner-up with a respectable 22% of the votes. With the Beatles complete recording sessions, author and Beatles historian Mark Lewison created what international musician proclaimed as a Beatles fan's dream filled with information which can be found nowhere else. I'll just take a moment to cover some info from Lewison's website bio. He is the acknowledged world authority on the Beatles. His books include Tune In, which is the first volume of his historical trilogy, The Beatles, All These Years, as well as the best-selling and influential Recording Sessions, The Complete Beatles Chronicle, and, as co-author, The Beatles London. He was consultant and researcher for all aspects, TV, DVDs, CDs, and book of The Beatles Anthology. The Beatles Complete Recording Sessions is 204 pages chock full of serious documentation on the history of the EMI sessions, which produced the Beatles' core catalog of recordings. At about 11 and a quarter inches square, the dimensions of this book are just an inch shorter than the size of an LP jacket. This edition retails for $24.99 in the U.S., but at the time of this video's publication was available for less than $20 on sites like Amazon. Acknowledged right from the start, this book was created with the invaluable assistance of those people directly involved in the story. Among others, Beatles producer George Martin, their publicist Derek Taylor, and engineer Jeff Emrick were interviewed for this project. This is irreplaceable information as these primary source individuals are no longer with us. Lewison was granted access to work started by EMI engineer John Barrett, who sadly died of cancer in 1984, before completing an archive project he began in the early 1980s. With unprecedented access to listen to all of the Beatles' working tapes, Lewison embarked on an incredible journey which produced this book. As you can see, the contents are broken down by year, starting from 1962, and the first EMI recording, Love Me Do, and going straight through to the mixing of Let It Be in 1970. There are some great images in this book, including some previously unpublished photographs. Following a preface, an interview with Paul McCartney is presented. Lewison himself called this a splendidly entertaining and illuminating interview. Inexcusably, I have never owned this glorious Beatles publication before. This edition is the first I'm seeing of this book. As there is no indication of the date, I wondered when the McCartney interview took place. I assumed it was an interview from maybe 87 or 88 that was included in the original publication, but I wasn't sure. Enter Beatles fan extraordinaire, Michael Crawley. Michael is a subscriber to the channel and frequently provides thoughtful commentary and constructive criticism. In discussing my inquiry, 
Michael was willing to dig into his archives to provide me the answer I needed. His first U.S. edition of the Beatles' recording sessions, the official Abbey Road Studio Session Notes, 1962-1970, published as a hardback by Harmony Books in 1989, did indeed include the introductory interview with Paul McCartney. I appreciated Michael's help with that. As always, I enjoy discussing all things Beatles with fellow fans. My next question for Mr. Crawley is with a collection like this, when are you going to start making videos of your own? I'm sure you have plenty of interesting pieces to show and intelligent commentary to make. Go for it. The McCartney interview spans 10 pages of the book. Subsequent to the interview and a brief prologue, the pages take the form of a diary with day-by-day -day breakdowns documenting the Beatles' hectic recording session schedule, as well as time spent by producers and engineers mixing and editing the recordings we've all come to know and love. And so it begins. Wednesday, the 6th of June, 1962. The Beatles occupy EMI Studio 2 or 3 for a two-hour recording session from 6 to 8 p.m. Recordings are made of songs Besame Mucho, Love Me Do, P.S. I Love You, and Ask Me Why. Each entry notes the date, the studio location, the session time, and the songs recorded or mixed, including the number of takes and the name of the producer and engineers involved. Lewison then gives some details of the particular session. There's also information on the differences between mono and stereo mixes, and the technical advancements first pioneered on the Beatles recordings. Q Magazine called the complete Beatles recording sessions excellent. The Fab's shirt sleeve days and chain smoking nights inside the celebrated EMI studios cast a fascinating light upon the sessions. Eight pages are dedicated to 1962, with the final studio date of the year being a George Martin mixing session on Friday, November 30th, which the Beatles did not attend. 1963 is notated over 14 pages. It begins with a single release of Please Please Me on January 11th and ends with a single release of I Want to Hold Your Hand on the 29th of November. Fourteen pages detail 1964, from studio sessions in January to the LP release of Beatles for Sale on December 4th. This was the fourth LP released by the Beatles in 21 months. It's unbelievable just how profuse the Beatles were. Dedicated to 1965 are 16 pages chronicling the Beatles as they continue at the breakneck pace they'd set for themselves. The 15th of February was set aside for the first recordings of the year, those being Another Girl and I Need You, which were to be released on the Help album. Closing out 1965 is the release of not only the We Can Work It Out single on December 3rd, but also the Rubber Soul album. It really is quite astonishing the stride these guys maintain. As longtime subscriber of my channel, Mr. Lennon Axel pointed out in a comment he posted on the poll I referenced earlier, the thing that amazes me is that the Rubber Soul album session started October 12, 1965. The album was on the shelves December 3rd. That's pressure to have an album out by Christmas. After a much needed break at the start of 1966, the Beatles continued to roll along as illustrated over the next 22 pages. On Wednesday, the 6th of April, 1966, the Beatles were in the studio for the first time that year, recording the truly remarkable Tomorrow Never Knows. It's ironic that this radical recording, which was to end the Revolver LP, was the first to be put to tape for that album. Already at work on Sgt. Pepper, 1966 ends with a December 30th session, which consisted of occupying Studio 2 from 7 in the evening to 3 in the morning. This session produced a mono mix of When I'm 64, tape copying of Strawberry Fields Forever, and recording and mixing of Penny Lane. The Beatles returned to EMI early in January 1967 to continue work on Sgt. Pepper and the Penny Lane, Strawberry Fields Forever single. 39 pages are required to cover all of the studio activity the Beatles engaged in throughout the course of the year. Some really nice color photos are included in this section of the book. 1968 spans the next 32 pages. This is perhaps one of the most prolific years of the Beatles' career. George alone kicked off the new year in the studio over five days in January 1968. Harrison worked on what would become his composition, 
The Inner Light, at EMI Recording Studio in Bombay. The Beatles were together in the studio in February, prior to their visit to India, where many new songs would be composed. Of course, much of the studio time in 1968 is dedicated to recordings for the White Album, released in November that year. As we've learned of late, January 1969 is perhaps the best documented period in Beatles history. In fact, I would say this section of the book could use a few tweaks now that the period has been so thoroughly archived by Peter Jackson and his team. For example, this photo paints a bleak picture. The caption reads, Glum faces and bad times. George, Ringo, Yoko, John, and Paul listen to a playback of a clearly uninspired Get Back session tape. We now know from Peter Jackson's great Get Back docuseries that all those years ago, things were not as dreary as we were originally led to believe. Fortunately, Lewison acknowledges this as well, as evident from this January 30th, 2022 tweet, which reads, Enduringly human, honest, hopeful, and uplifting in this despicably brutal world. The Beatles, still getting better all the time. The first seven pages of 1969 are dedicated to those get-back sessions from January, including the iconic rooftop performance. The remaining 25 pages chronicle mixing sessions, singles, and the recordings which would make up the Abbey Road album. 1969 ends with the release of the charity album, No One's Gonna Change Our World, which featured the debut disc performance of Across the Universe. 1970 is covered by a mere five pages. From the final date, all four Beatles were together inside EMI Studios on January 3rd, recording I Me mean Mine, to the LP release of Let It Be on Friday, the 8th of May, 1970. This is a fascinating look at the Beatles studio work from their active years at EMI. What a trip! Following the day-by-day chronicle is this discography, detailing all Beatles recordings issued in the UK and the US between 1962 and 1970, showing original release dates and original catalog numbers. The 1987 CD releases are also mentioned, and it's here that I will credit Mark Lewison for his excellent liner notes included with the original 1988 release of Past Masters Volume 1 and Volume 2. I was quite annoyed that those notes were not included in the 2009 combined release of Past Masters. When first gathering together a collection of all the Beatles recordings on CD, Lewison made the task extremely simple by way of those included notes in Past Masters. Finally, there is an index, a glossary, and a coda by Ken Townsend, who worked with the Beatles as a sound engineer at EMI in the 60s, and even invented artificial double tracking, or ADT. By the time of the original publication of Lewison's book, Townsend had become general manager of Abbey Road Studios. For his part, Townsend briefly goes into a bit about the evolution of recording technology at EMI. This is a great Beatles book. Rolling Stone called it a compelling journey deep into the heart of Abbey Road, an outstanding reference book. Record Collector called it the ultimate word on the subject, one of the most important rock books of all time. Absolutely essential purchase for everyone interested in the Beatles. For an even deeper dive, Lewison combined the work of the complete Beatles recording sessions and an earlier book, The Beatles Live, for his 1992 book, The Complete Beatles Chronicle. That book provides an exhaustive day-by-day account of the group. Mark Lewison has not been very involved with writing directly for the Beatles for a while now. Contemporary and collaborator Kevin Howlett has continued to be a contributor to the Beatles releases over the years, but Lewison has been surprisingly absent. Could this be due to some unfavorable information published in Lewison's multi-volume publication, The Beatles, All These Years? Whatever the cause may be, it's a real shame as Mark Lewison is being underappreciated as a Beatles historian. While this video is a more back-to-basics presentation, my last video was not only more experimental, but the longest I've done to date. It seems there were some mixed feelings about bringing in a collaborator and perhaps over-egging the pudding just a bit with the comedic elements. I like to branch out a little now and then, So constructive criticism 
and respectful feedback is helpful in planning future content and shaping videos. Comment away. Join the conversation. Thanks for watching.